You hear me? Yes. All right. All right, so a little bit delayed there, technical reasons. Um, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm happy to see some people actually coming here. You know, I checked the schedule and uh, I saw that we're competing with 11 other uh, talks at the moment and some of them from Microsoft and Facebook. So, so even I want to be somewhere else. So <laughs> thank you for showing up. <laughs> um, Anyway, so I'm here to talk about, uh, as the title suggests, uh, how to, or my, our experiences deploying the hyperscale approaches uh, uh, mentality uh, and OCP technology at a much smaller scale than the hyperscale companies do. Sorry for the flickering, I hope you don't get any seizures. Um, so I work for a company, Arctic Circle Data Center, or ACDC, as we like to call it. Uh, we're located in the northern parts of Norway. And uh, uh, we have a couple of business areas. Uh, one is that we are developing a data center campus area in the town where we're located. Um, not gonna say much more about that in this presentation. Uh, my primary focus at the moment is the development and launch of a public cloud service, which is in this context what I'm gonna be talking about. So um, our vision for our public cloud service is to combine edge computing and cloud computing, so that customers that currently have too much data to utilize cloud computing um, services from you know, the usual suspects. Uh, if you have terabytes of data and you need them processed by tomorrow, then it's just not an option for you to upload all of that to a data center in Ireland or Frankfurt or wherever. So you cannot use cloud services. Okay, sure. Yeah, so our idea is then to bring cloud services out to where they don't reach today. To, uh, well, you, all, you have all heard what uh, the future brings for edge computing with 5G and IoT and drones and autonomous vehicles and, and so on and so forth. But uh, the current state of affairs is more that if you have too much data to process in the cloud, you're but you have to run your own infrastructure and uh, make your own platforms, et cetera. You cannot use the cloud services. And we want to bridge that gap by deploying uh, small decentralized modules, uh, deployment units in a distributed fashion, geographically distributed, rather than having one large centralized data center. Um, and I want to say something about redundancy, availability, fault tolerance, because uh, the traditional data center approach is that you duplicate everything. You have dual generators and dual UPSs, and uh, you duplicate the power distribution in your data center all the way to the rack and to the individual server, and the server has dual power supply units. Uh, but if you, if you are that kind of enterprise that has a single critical server that runs your critical service, then you still have single points of failure. The redundancy stops when you reach the motherboard. Uh, so you will have downtime. And this is something that the hyperscale companies realized long, long time ago. And they started building fault tolerance into the IT, into the software layer. Um, and when you do that, when you build fault tolerance into software, then all of this extra redundancy that you have on the infrastructure level becomes redundant in the true sense of the word to some extent. Because um, in, if you can have multiple distributed deployment units and you can replicate data across these and you can move workloads from one uh, unit to another, then you don't need the full redundant infrastructure at each site as you would with a large centralized data center. And this is, uh, this is the approach of hyperscale companies and it can also be the approach of smaller companies like our startup. So we've designed these deployment infrastructure solutions and we control everything all the way from uh, mechanical, electrical, cooling, all the way to what hardware we uh, run and uh, what software we run and we use primarily open source. So what are we using? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, when I talk about deploying open compute, I'm talking about what we have deployed. So for instance, we're not using Project Olympus. So uh, some of the stuff I'm going to say now may, might not be relevant uh, in that context. So what we are using is open rack. Uh, we do use uh, local batteries in the rack. Uh, we use the Leopard and Tioga Pass service, uh, the NOX uh, JBOD, 
plan also to start using the, the Lightning JBuff. Uh, networking gear is non-OCP in our setup. And we use uh, OpenStack and other open source software on top of uh, the hardware. So why did we choose OCP? Uh, one reason is that we're big fans of open source. Uh, we use it a lot and we plan to d donate much of what we invent also to the open source community. Um, the containers we use for deploying our cloud in various locations, uh, we have designed ourselves, but we plan to donate those designs to uh, OCP. Um, Also, uh, we feel that the approaches done by the hyperscale companies and a lot of the innovation that you see around here happens in the hyperscale companies. Uh, these are the ones that drive the innovation, not, in our, not Dell or HP in our view. So uh, we would like to just uh, pick the fruits from their innovation and use it in our company, which doesn't have as much resources for innovation as they do. So what is it that hyperscale companies do, actually? Um, basically, when you reach a very large scale, then all the optimization you can do becomes relevant. If you're very small, then the power consumption for, uh, for transceivers in your switches doesn't really matter at all. Uh, it's, it's not something you, you even consider when you calculate your costs. But when you get to hyperscale, all the optimization you can do matters a lot. And it's not just about cost. It's also about well, energy efficiency is also about cost. But it's also about uh, how you do availability. Uh, so I'm going to go through each of these bullets that you can hardly see <laughs> and uh, talk a little bit about the theory and how it applies to us. Uh, so um, one, th one way to optimize harvest costs is to make the hardware simpler. So if you don't have power supplies in your service, you don't pay for the power supplies and they don't fail because they don't exist. Uh, so that's an advantage. Uh, also, if the specifications are open, you can buy parts from different manufacturers. So you can make them compete on prices and you can make them compete on time and you avoid the lock-in uh, drawbacks. Um, and also, uh, another point is that if you need to sort of refill or uh, buy more equipment and you want your uh, installation to stay homogenous. Uh, if you are using proprietary products, they might say, no, we are not producing this anymore. So you have to buy some different architecture. Whereas if you have an open design, you can go to a manufacturer and say, please produce this in this many units for us. So you can still stay homogenous. Um, so how is this for a small customer? Um, so we cannot go directly to the manufacturers because we're not ordering 100,000 units of anything. So we are directed to a smaller supplier. And they're, they're really great, they're helpful. But they don't keep a lot of stock. So that means that when you want to buy something, you have to, uh, it has to be produced and it has to be shipped from Asia. And uh, this leads to, it can take a lot of time, up to 12 weeks, six, nine, 12 weeks to get uh, equipment delivered. Um, also, since uh, this is still a small part of the overall hardware market, it means that uh, rarely shipments are bundled a lot, so you carry most of the shipment costs yourself. Uh, and one thing I'd like to note here is that uh, at, at the beginning when you started uh, using OCP or ordering OCP hardware, we noticed that uh, we couldn't buy, like this, uh, for instance, the same newest C Intel CPU architectures as we know that some of the hyperscale companies were already purchasing at that time. So we're sort of we were sort of behind on architecture, and that's basically a cost because then you're not as efficient and therefore not as competitive. Um, so it's worth noting. Uh, as I said, we use the local uh, energy store, batteries in the rack. Um, it's, it 
turned out to be, it seems it's quite uncommon outside of the hyperscale world. And it's probably because most installations are in an existing data center, which probably has an existing centralized UPS solution. So nobody bothers to buy batteries for the racks. Um, whereas we didn't deploy in a, an existing data center. So we, as I said, we build everything from the ground up. Um, so for a couple of racks, uh, the battery solutions were quite pricey. And uh, uh, I'm not sure that this was cost-wise an advantage over a centralized UPS solution. But still, it's, it is an advantage for us because it's not just about cost. It is about uh, the approach that we have to redundancy, availability, to have a, a more local blast zone, if you will, for a local failure domain. And also, uh, our deployment units are small containers and we don't have space for a separate UPS room. So we wanted this anyway, even if it was quite expensive. Um, I want to say something about what open means. Uh, when uh, you have a specification, specification will detail some parts, like sizes of things, uh, voltage, etc. And these are the interfaces at which you can integrate uh, uh, hardware from different manufacturers and, and different suppliers. Uh, so, for example, you can take a server from one manufacturer and plug into a rack from a different manufacturer, and that's, that will work because it's the defined interface. They, they all adhere to the same specification. Uh, whereas there are some things that are not a specified interface. And uh, I'll use an example here. It's an interface between the rack and the bus bar behind the rack, uh, how these are connected. That is not a specified interface, so implementations here are free to differ. And... Uh, uh, this is exactly what we did. Um, since we wanted the battery solution, um, the rack manufacturer that we could get the racks from uh, the fastest didn't produce battery shelves. Uh, another rack manufacturer did produce battery shelves, but they did this for one of the hyperscale companies. So it was sort of tailored to them. So for management and monitoring of the battery and power shelves, you would require a certain software, a particular software running on a particular switch. So that was not an option for us. And there's a third rack manufacturer that does produce battery shelves, but they would, if we would buy the racks from them, it would take too much time. So we ended up buying the rack from one manufacturer and uh, battery and power shelves from another. And that's interesting. <laughs> so it required a bit of adaptation. <laughs> It, a bit of drilling and some creative solutions, but hackers be hackers. We made it work, but it took a couple of days to figure it out, to get all the stuff aligned. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I would recommend purchasing tested solutions. <laughs> so the theory, optimizing energy costs. So avoiding the double conversion of a standard UPS. You just send raw AC directly to the rack, and you have a single AC-DC power conversion in the power shelf, and you do DC on the bus part to all of the service and the hardware. Um, and um, that's uh, quite all right. Uh, but something I learned when we started doing this is that uh, there are different power distribution systems uh, in different places of uh, parts of the world. And the open rack, wants, uh, it, this is not di dictated by the spec, but the power shelves that you can buy, they all expect a 400 volt three phase uh, power carrying also a neutral. That's, that's a TN network. Uh, in some places in the world, you have an IT network which does not carry a neutral. And in those cases, you need to install a transformer. So that some, somewhat subverts the whole idea of a single AC-DC conversion because here you have another conversion from 400 volt IT to 400 volt TN. And transformers really suck because uh, you, they don't scale. You have to choose a size. And if, it's, if you want to grow, you have to install one that's big enough for your growth. And until you've grown to actually utilize all of that capacity, it's just too big and wasted capital. And once you grow past that point, you have to replace it. You can't just install another one or increase the size of it. You have to just throw it out and get another one. So, so that was a bit of a bad surprise for us, but this is a problem in Norway and Albania, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Not much elsewhere in the world. <laughs> um, DC delivery in the rack, uh, that's good. It's great, but there's 
uh, chances are you will run uh, some equipment that's not OCP. And uh, so we have switches that want 230 volts AC. And uh, you can get that from the rack, but it's, it's just the raw input AC. So it means there's no insulation against the bad power quality. And also, if you lose the power, uh, the batteries in the rack won't help you. They'll just deliver DC to the DC equipment in the rack. So, uh, so what, uh, what did we do about that? Uh, we bought some uh, extra, uh, extra uh, one extra 19-inch rack for the network equipment and just some small rack-mounted UPSs in that rack for the network equipment so that we have like the non-OCP gear separated from the OCP, from the open rack. Uh, it's not a big investment, so it's a, it's a tolerable solution. Cooling. Uh, lots of the OCP hardware is specified to work with inlet temperatures of up to 35 degrees Celsius. And we're located in the north of Norway, and we never have more than 35 degrees Celsius ambient temperature. So that means we can do efficient uh, cooling solutions, and that works great for us. Um, front operated. That's really good. Not just because it's practical, but uh, in our case, our deployment unit, uh, unit is a standard industry container, and those are not too wide. As you can see here, we have angled racks to fit them in. And even, even, if they're, even though they're angled, when you pull out a J-Bot drawer, for instance, it takes up a lot of space in front of the rack. And uh, not having to regularly go behind the rack means that you can make the hot aisle really narrow so we can fit this in a standard industry container. And that means that deploying uh, units of our cloud uh, geographically distributed is really easy. We can prepare everything, all the IT equipment, and just ship it on a train or a boat or whatever, and put it somewhere where you can plug in power and fiber and you have the cloud present at the end. So this is a great advantage compared to modules that you have to build on the site. Um, the tool-less design is uh, superb, fantastic. Uh, just a few things that you still need. Mounting the CPU uh, heat sinks, for instance, you need a screwdriver. Other, uh, other than that, everything's great. Um, if I could make a wish list of stuff I'd like in the future for us as an adopter of OCP, it would be uh, proprietary products also come in a, a open rack integratable format. Uh, some, so switches that could uh, consume 12 volt DC directly from the bus bar instead of uh, having uh, power supplies for AC. Uh, and that's actually coming. I just talked to uh, one of the network equipment manufacturers here yesterday and they said quarter or two it will be on the market. So that's, we're really looking forward to that. One other idea could be if you could install into the rack a converter for, um, from DC to back to AC, 230 volts for, ins for instance, that you could use for your AC equipment, non-OCP equipment, and still use the local energy store as the UPS for that equipment. Uh, that would be great. Uh, sometimes we'd like to take a server out of the data center and just work on it in the office and uh, having sort of a Small, a miniature bus bar that we could uh, plug it into would be great. And if there would, could be uh, power supplies, power shelves for IT power, then OCP would be extremely popular in Albania and Norway. Um, so, final slide. Some recommendations for you. Um, delivery times is an issue. Plan early. Uh, discuss with your supplier. Make sure you buy the right equipment. Uh, Start as soon as possible to mitigate that. Uh, look at what existing power distribution you have. If you're in an ex existing data center, look at what they offer. If you don't, look at what the, the power companies or the grid offers where you are. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, I think I'm one slide behind here. <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, make sure that you mix vendors only at defined interface boundaries and uh, try not to be too creative about <laughs> mixing stuff. Um, have a plan for how to deal with non-OCP gear because you're probably gonna have some. And last but not least, um, you need 
a supplier that's, uh, that you have good chemistry with, so you can uh, get help and discuss your needs, and uh, there will be lots of ping-ponging and rounds back and forth to, to get, get it right. And uh, we're quite happy with ours. Uh, he's sitting there. <laughs> and he even uh, survived a bus crash coming to northern Norway in January to help us with our installation. So that's, I have only positive things to say about uh, that guy. <laughs> with that, I think we can open for questions. We have uh, three racks as of today. But uh, our deployment units are, uh, each container can scale up to about 12 racks, 150 kilowatts. Yeah, so it, we have already, yes, okay. So I think the question was, when will we switch uh, to using OCP network equipment? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure yet, I, but I think we will probably start with the, the spine infrastructure at first. Um, for NICs, probably still commercial uh, proprietary products, uh, but for, for switches, the network fabric, we might start looking into the, um, some of the open uh, OCP stuff because it's, it's good and it's cheaper. Um, so some very good development there. Um, cannot give you an exact timeline yet. Other questions? Okay, thanks for your patience with the yeah, bad video. So All right. Great job. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I know.